349. I want to welcome you out today. Looking forward to a good day in God's house. 349, I am resolved. Here we go. I am resolved no longer to linger. That's good singing. We're going to open with a word of prayer. We're going to open up the altars if you'd like to come and, and uh, have a special need. Burden. I do have a couple of prayer requests to add while people are coming. Uh, Brooke Schreiber, I believe it is pronounced. Schreiber. Uh, it's it's uh, Ron's granddaughter has a concussion, and so pray for her. She's getting better. Ten years old, uh, getting a little better, but just continue to pray for her. Also, uh, Dave and Jill Marthy called me this week, and first of all, they're under the weather. They're sick, but uh, Michelle, which is Dave's niece that we were praying for, uh, passed away yesterday. Of cancer, and so just be in prayer for that family. A lot of folks out with sick with colds and, and flu and things like that. And so, as we come to the Lord in prayer, let's let's go ahead and pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today. We thank you, Lord, for the the privilege that we have of prayer, knowing that we can boldly come before the throne of grace, or with our requests, or knowing that you hear. But not only do you hear, but you answer as you promised, Lord. I pray that you'd be with these requests. I think of Brooke, Lord, with this concussion. I pray that you just just uh, continue to heal her body, Lord. I pray for. Uh, the Marthy family, Lord, and the loss of Michelle, I pray that you would just give them comfort. And, Lord, I pray that you would just work through this situation for your honor and glory, Lord. Uh, we thank you that she was saved. We thank you that she's now with you. No more suffering, no more pain. But, Lord, there's a lot of folks in the family, Lord, who are struggling with some issues. And, Lord, I pray that you would just use this uh, this uh, situation, Lord, to bring some healing. And, Lord, to uh, just, Lord, just, just, just... We ask you to just do something special in that family. Lord, I pray also there's many folks who are out sick today with colds and flu and, and just unable to be here. Lord, we pray you be with them, be with our shut-ins. Lord, give them grace, Lord, for each and every day. Lord, bless our service. Lord, I thank you for the good Sunday school hour we've had. And Lord, for each of the teachers who prepared lessons. Lord, I thank you for the, those who've come out to hear and to learn. And I pray that you just help, just bless them for their efforts there. Lord, I pray that you bless our, our service here today as well. Lord, just give us a, a great time, Lord, of uh, just as we go to your word, as we take time to... Uh, just hear what you have to say for us. Let's bless us in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't sit down. Why don't we do this? Let's go ahead and shake hands right now. There's no choir this morning, so we'll go ahead and shake hands. With, uh, just talk about being blessed and how, how we need to be thankful. And so, young people, go ahead and sing for us if you would. We are
young people. Amen. Let's have our ushers come forward if you would. We'll receive our offering. Come on forward while they're coming. Just uh, as a reminder, if you, uh, if you did not get a chance last week or if you're still uh, planning to put in your faith promise card, we have some that are on the back table. You can grab this and just uh, put on there how much per month you would give. And then what we do is, uh, it, starting in January, you would if, say you put, in, put down $50 per month. January, you put $50 down in with one of the envelopes in the, in the, the offering envelopes, Mark Missions. And then in January, or February, $50, put that in an envelope, Mark Missions, put in the offering, March 8th, etc. So if you have not had a chance to do that, please do so. And we're just trying to collect everything that we can to be able to know what we can have for our missions budget for next year. All right, let's go ahead and have, have a word of prayer. Brother John Johnson, leave some prayer for the offering. Well, I give you a little praise the Lord for that. 
Birthdays and anniversaries. If you had a birthday today or this past week to recognize, would you raise your hand? Birthdays. Who had a birthday today or this week? John. Who are we pointing at? Who are we pointing at? Jay Lynn. Jay Lynn had a birthday on the 11th. And how old are you? Yeah, you weren't here last week. How old are you now? 15 years old. Wow. 15. Kenzie? Oceana had her birthday, and, and she is now how old? Four. Wow. Happy birthday to you, too. You can hardly see her sitting in that seat. Uh, who else? Anyone else with a birthday? Summer? Who? Lindsay. You're right. Lindsay had a birthday. Lindsay, uh, what day was your birthday? The 13th. And uh, how old are you now? 25. Man, whew. Old lady, 25. Still looks like a little kid, huh? Still looks like a kid. Uh, anyone else? Any other birthdays to recognize? All right, let's sing happy birthday to all these folks here. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. What about wedding anniversaries? Any wedding anniversaries to recognize? Looking for wedding anniversaries. I don't see anybody. All right, then. I think at this point, I think we've got all the announcements out of the way. I think we've got all that done. Uh, Brother Brad, you ready to take your young people? Miss Melanie, you ready? All right, we're going to let the young people be dismissed to their junior church. Three, three, four, and five-year-olds there. First and sixth graders downstairs. And then the rest of you, get your mission songbook. There should be some mission songbooks right there for you. And we're going to start off with uh, page 18. I think the tune is uh, We're Marching to Zion, number 18. And uh, in your mission songbook, number 18. Let's stand together if you will. We're going to sing two songs out here, number 18 and then number 12. But Tim, Tim, come lead us if you would. Number 18 in your mission songbook. The, the tune is, uh, let me find it here real quick. Let me get there. Page 18. The song is We're Spreading the Gospel. The tune is We're Marching to Zion. Join with us on that first verse if you would. Come ye that love the Lord, and let God's word be known. Involve your life to preach God's word. Involve your life to preach God's word. And so make Jesus known, and so make Jesus known. We're spreading the gospel, telling the gospel of Jesus. We're telling the gospel of Jesus. And go out everywhere and let the lost ones know that Jesus paid redemption price, that Jesus paid redemption price because he loves them so, because he loves them so. We're spreading the gospel, telling the gospel of Jesus, we're telling the gospel of Jesus as we've been commanded to. Go ahead. Now, number 12, if you would. Number 12, and we're going to do, the tune is At the Cross. The song is If They Never See the Light. Praise God and sins my since my sovereign died. I'll go and do what Jesus said and take him as my guide. No one lost, no one lost if they never see the light. And if no one takes their burden, if the heathen die in the gloom of simple night, if they never know a single happy day, see then it's written in his word, the workers are so few. Why do we call the Savior Lord, but fail his work to do? Oh, what loss, oh, what loss, if they never see the light, and if no one her burdens away. If the heathen die in the gloom of sinful night, if they never know a single happy day, is it not now my daily task to see his work to do? How can it be too much to ask when labors are so few? Oh, what loss, oh, what loss if they never see the light? And if no one takes their burdens away, if the heathen die in the gloom of sinful night, if they never know a single happy day.
Thank you, baby. Seated. And if you go go ahead and get your Bibles out, you can go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Let me sing a special and then we'll get right into there. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to pick up somewhere about verse 21, 22 without the Bible right in front of me. Trust the song be a blessing to you. Someday the stammering tongue will falter no more. And the grander, sweeter song I shall sing. For I'll join the ransom choir on heaven's bright shore forever to praise the King. And while the ages roll, I'll keep on praying. Him, and my voice will never tire or grow old, and my song shall ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me, and I'll sing it while ages shall roll. When a million years have passed, In that wonderful place, my song of praise will just have begun. For my joy will never end while I look on His face, and my song will never be done. And while the ages roll, I'll keep on praising Him, and my voice will never tire or grow old. And my song shall ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me, and I'll sing it while ages shall roll. And while the ages roll, I'll keep on praising Him, and my voice will never tire or grow old. And my song shall ever be, praise the Lamb who died for me, and I'll sing it while ages shall roll. And my song shall ever be, praise the Lamb, who died for me, and now sing it while ages shall roll. Amen. Amen. Think about eternity. Think about all the time we'll have to... I mean, we we sing praise to Him now, and we need to. We ought to. We deserve... he, He deserves it. Think about when we get to heaven. We get to see Him personally. And it'll be so, so, so much more real to us. That it's not just the Jesus that we know from the Bible. It's not just the Jesus that we know from the Spirit that dwells within us. It's the Jesus that we will see. If we walk by faith today, but then we will walk by sight. Whew! What a good time that will be. Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. And uh, we are rapidly coming to, to the end here of, chapter, of the book of Ephesians, whether you believe it or not. And uh, uh, we're going to look here. We've been looking in, in the first three chapters, just as a quick review. First three chapters uh, were dealt with doctrinal truths that we need to know about our about our salvation, about the fact that we are children of God uh, through our salvation, being in Christ, uh, about the the different blessings that we have, the fact that we're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, we 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 saw the importance of, of the fact that it's by grace through faith that we're saved, not of works, the same man should boast. We talked about the fact that uh, we are all Jew, Gentile, everyone is equal, everyone is part of the church itself, the body of Christ, Christ being the head. We came to chapter 4 and we saw the, pra- the, the doctrinal practices that we ought to have because of the doctrinal truths that we know. And chapter 4 starts off by saying, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And he talks about the, the, the attitudes and the behaviors of what we ought to do as Christians. That we are to be humble, that we are to be meek, that we are to to uh, have dwell, to endeavor for the spirit of unity with one another. Uh, we it talks about things like speaking the truth 
uh, to, with one another. It talks about the, the thought of being uh, putting away lying. It talks, about, it talks about the thought of being angry and sinning not, and never giving place to the devil, and things like that. Uh, chapter five, we talked about the first part there. It talks about uh, the being followed. Therefore, there be ye therefore followers of God as your children, walk in love as Christ also has loved us. And we've seen the importance of just as this Christian walk. And uh, we've come to the last few weeks that we looked in this this passage before our missions uh, conference time. We saw that in in uh, verse 15. Talked about walking circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Where we're watching, where we're observing, making sure that we watch out for those pitfalls, those dangerous areas. Uh, verse 16, redeeming the time, meaning that we're going forward, we're using our time for the best as we can for the cause of Christ. Why? Because the days are evil. Verse 17, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And we talk about the will of God in our lives, that every Christian, the same, it's the will of God for every Christian to, to live a life that is pleasing to him. We went through several different things with that. Uh, we then looked at verse 18 and 18 through 21. Uh, the last time we looked here, we talked about the importance of being not drunk with wine, wherein it's excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Submit yourselves in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. It said, as we're in this walk, as we're dealing with people, as we are uh, walking circumspectly, as we are redeeming the time, all these different things, as we do this, we are submitting one to another. We are living our life in order to be a help to others. It's not. It's and when we do it right, when we submit one to another, uh, it's not that one person is is putting themselves as in a lower position, if you want to say, it, so that the other can be can abuse their elevated position. We are all submitting one to another. In essence, I I would say, for example, so Brother Rocky, I would say, listen, I want to be a help to you in any way I can, anything I can do for you. I'm here to help serve you. At the same time, he would say, Pastor, the same goes for me. I want to be there to help you and to, to anything I can do to be, and we submit one to another. And then we come into the last part of chapter five, and, and we'll see how far we go. Chapter five deals with husbands and wives. Chapter six starts off with children and parents. Uh, chapter six also continues on with, with masters and servants and things like that. And we'll see how quickly we can go through here. We don't want to just go through quickly to say we finish it, but at the same time, we're not going to try to get bogged down here. So let's pray as we look here in the book of Ephesians. Our Heavenly Father, bless us now as we take some time to look at your word. Lord, just give us guidance uh, for this passage. Lord, help us know how far to go, how far not to go. And Lord, just just uh, help us to glean from your word. Truths, Lord, for our, our personal lives as well as for the ministries that we are part of for our homes. In Jesus' name, amen. Coming off the same thought of verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Meaning, Christians, we submit one to another. Then 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, here, here's, where all the, here, here's where we get to have all the chauvinist male pigs get to say, Amen, Amen. There we go. Now, uh, we're going to look here at the proper balance of husbands and wives and the purpose for what their relationship ought to be. But keep in mind this. Now, it does say, Husbands or wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. And then it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, let's look at verse 24. The, verse 23 and 24 gives us the doctrinal truth of Christ being the head of the church. And all of us would agree, amen. Uh, he's the one who, he, he's the Savior of the body, it says. Therefore, verse 24, as the church is subject unto Christ, and we ought to be obedient to Christ, uh, let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. All right, now, at the same point, we, we, we look at that and... and uh, uh, I'm, I, I can already see the looks on people's faces. Where's he going to go? What, what are we going to hear? I, I can see wives who are waiting. All right, okay, preacher, what are you going to say? And I can see some of the men saying, well, I hope he says that I can talk to my wife the right way. Uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, who knows? What's he going to do? What's he going to say? We're going to see what the Bible says. Amen. Now, wives, submit unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, the example is Christ died for the church. Christ is the head of the church. As a church is subject to, to Christ, wives ought to be subject to your husbands. Now, keeping in mind, verse 21 just told us, as Christians, we are submitting one to another. It does not... Let me say, let, 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 let's move on now come back to it. I'll get there. Verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. 
He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hateth his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and they shall be joined unto uh, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, notice this. The first part, verse 22 through 24, tells us, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Then, verse 25 through verse, in essence, 32 deals with the husbands, and then verse 33 is a, is a reminder for both. He gives us doctrinally the truths that this, the husband is the head of the house, just as Christ is the head of the church. He then also says, but husbands, you are to love your wives as Christ loved the church. And Christ, how did he love the church? He gave himself for it. He, it tells us in verse 25 that he gave himself for the church. We know he died for him. He, was will, he willingly sacrificed himself for the church. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. He did it so that we could be saved. And that we could be sanctified and, and be, be pure and be holy and be useful for him. Uh, why? Verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Again, why did he do that? Not only to save us, so that, but that we would be a... a, uh, a bride, his body, we are the bride of Christ, so we would be a bride that is presented to him with, without blemish, holy, spotless, that glorious church. And I think, I think about this, I think about when, when you have a wedding, and I remember the only, I really, I think the only wedding I've done in this building since I've been here was, was Daryl and Lindsay. And I remember as we stood up here, and this was it moved out of the way, and, and I'm standing here, and Daryl's standing this side here, and we're watching, and all the men are there, and, and you know all the, the, the people are sitting, and this, the ladies have come down, and then the, the music comes to the da 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 and everybody stands, and here comes around the corner, here comes Lindsay, beautiful, glorious, pure, spotless wife, pure, and she comes down, and there's Daryl. I mean, listen, I looked good standing right here. I look good. The, the groomsmen, they all look sharp. The, the, the bridesmaids, I mean, they look very pretty, very beautiful. The crowd, look, all dressed up nice, looking good that day. But you know what? Guess where his eyes were? He looked right on her. He couldn't even take his eyes off her hardly as he watched her come down that aisle. And here she comes, beautiful, presented to him as that bride, that, that glorious bride, etc., God saves us so that way, and he's, he's sanctifying us, He's preparing us, He's making us pure, He's making us holy, he, he's, he's making us more uh, where, we are, where we sin less and less and less. He's helping us to be conformed to His image because He's preparing us to be His bride. Again, these are things that He is doing because He loves the church. And we're, we will get back to husbands and wives, I promise. And then He goes on to say in verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He says, that's the kind of love that men ought to have. In fact, they ought to love them like their own bodies. Why? He says in verse, uh, we're in verse 28, He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, cherisheth it even at the Lord's church. He says, husbands, you are to love your wives in such a way as your own self. Now think about it. We, let's be honest. We, in our flesh, are selfish people. We look out for number one. It's just, just how it is. You know, and, and, and we care for ourselves. And he says, that same thought of how you would care for yourself, you, know, you don't want to let yourself go hungry. You don't want to let yourself get harmed. You don't want to let yourself... So says, that's how you ought to love your wife. In fact, the Bible tells us that the two become one. And so therefore, when we are loving her, it's because we are loving ourselves as well. Because we are one. Then goes on to say this. Verse 30. Uh, again, do the picture with Christ. For we are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. He's the head, we are the body. For this cause shall man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. So the reminder there in verse 33 is that men, we need to love our wives, and wives, we need to reverence our husbands. So, Rachel, what does the Bible say? It says, wives, 
Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. It tells us this, ladies, that you are to submit yourself to that position of your husband. Now you say, well, wait a minute. What if he's a no good, rotten husband? Then you should have picked a better one in the first place. (laughs) Now, here's the picture what God wants. Okay? He's telling, now, he's telling these Christians in Ephesus, as you're walking worthy of this vocation, as you're following as dear children of God, he says, this is what your home ought to look like because it's a picture of Christ in the church. He says, Christ in the church, the church is subject to Christ because Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, let me say this. We as Christians, when we look to Christ, when we realize he died for us, amen? He rose from the dead. Hallelujah. He saved us when we called on him by faith. And he has promised us a home in heaven. He has promised to daily be with us. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He has promised to give us daily guidance. He has promised to protect us. He has promised to provide for us. He has promised to encourage us. And He does all these things. Amen? He has promised to to not only take care of us today and tomorrow, but for all eternity. He's got long-term in mind. he's, He's got it planned. He cares for us. And so as a Christian, knowing that that's what God is doing for us, it should be just common sense and very easy for us to say, why wouldn't I follow His lead? Am I right? Stephen, come here for a second. Don't worry, we're not husband and wife. (laughs) Hallelujah for that. If I were to lead Stephen around, It's, it's okay. If I were going to say, Stephen, I, and, and I care about Stephen. You know, he, he, I, we, I pick on him and everything. We have a good time. We have a good relationship. But, but I care about Stephen. And if I say, Stephen, I need you, you're going to follow me. Submit yourself to me. Just follow me. And I'm going to care for him as I would care for myself. If I say, let's go this way. Am I going to lead, go ahead and Am I going to lead him anywhere that's going to be harmful? Am I? No. And, and if, if I'm going this way, I just want to see if he's going to follow me. And uh, see how well this microphone works. You know, we're, we're doing well here, and we're coming over here, and he's doing a good job. Now, if I see, if I see that there's something dangerous in front of me, I'm going to say, we're going to, Stephen, come this way. Now, if he follows me, guess what? No harm for him, correct? Right? He's following me, and everywhere we go, I'm never going to lead him. I'm not going to say, all right, Stephen, we're going to go out and stand in the middle of the road. Because that's harmful for both myself and for him. That's harmful for him. And so why would I ever lead him out and say we're going to stand in the middle of the road? Why would I ever lead him to a place that's going to cause danger? Why would I ever lead him to a place that's going to harm him? Why would I ever... You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. Thank you. As Christians, first of all, we know that Christ is never going to lead us to a place that's going to harm us. It might be a place that's there for us to grow. It might be a, a struggle. Listen... We might have to go uphill a little bit and, and, and build a little muscle as we're walking uphill. It might not be flat ground all the way. But he's leading us in places that are for our benefit. That are for our help. And so as Christians, it's easy, or it should be easy for us to say, all right, Lord, I'll be glad to follow wherever you go. I'll be glad to submit to your leading. Okay, now, it says, wives, you ought to submit unto your husbands the same way. Again, This is a picture. He's talking to husbands and wives. He's talking to families in this passage. He's saying, this is a picture to the world as you are living for Christ, as you are following as dear children of Christ, as you are walking worthy of your vocation. This is going to be a picture to the world of the relationship that Christ has with His church. And so he says, first of all, wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as the church is subject to Christ. But we understand this, husband. This is where the... the, the, Notice it was three verses that dealt with wives submitting to the the men. And it took like about eight verses for them to get it through our fixed skulls, guys. Love your your wives, etc. If with Christ we know He's never going to lead us in the wrong way. With Christ we know that everything He's doing is for our benefit. Whether we even understand it or not. It's for our benefit. And as a Christian, we ought to easily say, all right, I'll be glad to... Husbands, we are... To our wives, the picture of Christ 
to the church. Therefore, as we are leading, and we as a husband, as I'm leading my wife, if I see something dangerous there, if I see something that's wrong, I'm going to say, listen, we, we need to go this way because it's not right. It, it, it's going to hurt us. It's going to harm us. And I'll go this way. And my wife ought to easily be able to say, all right, honey, I'm with you. Why? Because I, as a picture of Christ, am leading my wife and my home in a way that is right and best for them. Now you might say, well, that sounds good in theory, preacher. But here in the real world, if you... Now, I know we joke about stuff like that, but I'm dead serious right now. If you say, well, that sounds good in theory, preacher... I mean, it might, it might work there, you know, as far as doing it the way that God wants to perfectly, but here in our world, it's not like that. Then here's what needs to happen. Change your world to what God wants you to be. Change your world to what, that, what God wants you to be. Now, you might say, well, listen, that means first of all, let me put it on, let's put it on the, the, the head of the house first. Men, husbands, future husbands, Lead your home, love your wife, as Christ leads the church and as Christ loves the church. What did Christ do for the church? He gave Himself for it. He, it, it, when, think about, when, when it talks about how he's, he's sanctifying and cleansing with the washing of the water of the Word, they might present it to Himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that it should be holy without blemish. That thought is this. He's, he is... He's not, I'll just say it this way, He's not leading us in a way that is wrong and simple. He's leading us in a way that is holier and holier and holier through the cleansing of the Word. Holier, uh, separated unto Him, uh, to have a closer relationship with Him. Husbands, that's the kind of leading we need to be doing with our wives where we are leading them into that which is better and holy and right as opposed to leading them in a way that is sinful and wrong. Now, husbands, that is our responsibility. And I'll say this, it's our privilege. It's our privilege to be able to be a husband. It's a privilege to be able to be a husband who leads his family in the things that are right. Amen, preacher. Now, when the husband, and I'll put it on the husbands first because we ought, listen, we, if we're the head, as it says, we ought to take that seriously. As the husband is doing what they're supposed to do, it ought to be easy for the wife to say, listen, what he is doing as he is leading, it's there for my benefit. Now, is Christ going to lead us anywhere that's, that's going to harm us? No. Therefore, a husband who is being the husband that he ought to, is he going to lead the wife any way that is going to harm her? No. And so that's again where we say, yeah, but preacher, here in the real world, you don't know what my husband's like, or you don't know what my wife's like. Now, the answer is not to say, oh, yeah, I know that's what the real world is, so we throw this out. The answer is, what needs to be changed to be where it ought to be? Now, listen, I understand. We're all sinners. How many of you, and anybody been married to a perfect person? Didn't think so. My, if my wife were here, I'm sure she'd read. No way. None of us are married to... Husbands, you're not perfect. Wives, you're not perfect. We're all sinners. But we ought to all be working together as husbands and wives and as potential future husbands and wives to follow this pattern of husband as the head, leading in that which is right, and wives, without any hesitation, being able to say, I want to follow him because he's leading me as Christ leads the church. Now you might say, well, listen, my husband, we'll put it on the husband's word, my husband is not the spiritual leader that he ought to be. Let me just say this, this is a high note, um, and, and I know that today we're talking, we're talking about things that, some of the, the things that can't change, but I'll say this, for those who are not married yet, for those who are not married yet, when you're looking for your spouse, don't get married, and then wait to find out are they saved, are they serving the Lord, that kind of thing. If they're not saved, the Bible talks about not being unequally yoked. If they're not saved and you're a Christian, first of all, you shouldn't even be, don't even try to date them because 
once you start dating, you just might get an attachment. Next thing you know, you say, but I love them, or I love her, but I know that they're not saved. What do I do? You shouldn't have, just, you shouldn't have ever gotten to that point where you were emotionally attached in the first place. Okay? Those of you who are not married yet, look for somebody not only who's saved, but I'll say this. You ought to look for somebody who, listen, there's a lot of people who say, well, I'm saved, but never, serve, never go to the church, never see them crack a Bible open, never do anything to serve God. Listen, if you're in church, if you're faithful, as every Christian ought to be, don't just look for somebody who says, well, yeah, I'm saved. Oh, good, they said they're saved. Now we can get married. You're, you're looking, potentially you're going to cause a lot of trouble, a lot of harm. I, I, now listen, if you're here in a relationship like that, I'm not, I'm not beating up on you at all yet. Okay? I'm not saying that. I'm just saying for these folks who still have that opportunity that they're looking as you're looking, and, and let me also say this, I can get myself in trouble. If you're 13, 14, 15, young, you don't, necessarily, you don't need to be looking for a husband. For when, when Those relationships are geared for husband and wife. And, and unless you're old enough to be serious, to be say, you know what, this is the person that I'm going to be with and that you can, that you can get married, just, maybe I'll just wait a while. Maybe I'll just wait a while. Because, listen, I'll be honest, it, it, I, I know how, we know how we are. I remember, I'll say this, my, my uncle Rick and my Aunt Joanne, they've been married for probably getting close to 40 years now, I guess, 35, 40 years. They knew each other. They met, they met each other when they were about 12 in church. My uncle Rick will tell you, from the time I was 12, I knew I was going to marry that woman, that girl. And he'll say, if I could have, I would have married her at 12. Obviously, he couldn't. And, 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 and they waited until they were about 18, I think, is when they got married. But he said, I'll be honest, it was a hard time, all that time waiting, and just you know, knowing that this is going to be the person, but waiting and keeping themselves pure. So it was difficult. Now, here, here's the thing. In our society today, young people, the world tells you, go ahead, you don't need to keep yourself pure, you don't need to be chaste. Just... Find somebody and, and, and be immoral with them and do whatever you want to. And if, you don't, if it doesn't work out, find the next one and be immoral with them and then find the next one and the next one and the next one. That's not God's plan. There are emotions that are going to stir up, be stirred up in you that are geared for husbands and wives. And if you're not a, at a position where, you can be, where you're going to be able to get married, maybe I'll just back off and just be friends with people for a while. Get to know people. I promise you the best, the best marriages... Are based on good friendship as opposed to, but she's really pretty and he's really hot and handsome and rugged and all that stuff. Because guess what? Eventually, as pretty as she was, Stevie, eventually her looks might just fade. I know. And she might look at you and say, but Stevie, he's so handsome and so strong and he's got that, 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 that just everything about him just screams out, woohoo, he's good looking. Eventually. Eventually, well, just look around. You see what happens when we get old. And, uh, but a relationship built on friendship. Now, again, I'm just talking, I'm talking to those who are unmarried. Right? Those who are unmarried. A, a relationship that's built on a good, strong friendship where you know each other, where you know, you, know each other and you, you've seen them in their highs and their lows, where you, where you see what, they, what kind of a background they are, when you have an understanding of, of maybe even of their family, things like that. After, obviously, that we've already talked about, they're saved, they're serving God. That's what you look for. Now, in this context here, we're talking about people who are already married. So what happens? What if my husband or my wife don't faithfully serve God? What, what if they're not even saved? What do I do? What if my husband's not the right spiritual leader that he ought to be? How can I ever submit to somebody like that? Well, here's what the Bible tells us in First, first Peter. Go there real quick. We'll come back to Ephesians in a few moments. 1 Peter chapter 3. God understood that there would be homes where you have... People. Sometimes it's, it's somebody who gets saved after marriage. Sometimes it's people who are married and, and, and their spouse just backslides or whatever it might be. Chapter 3 of 1 Peter says, Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if they obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. That's by their behavior. Verse 2, While they behold your chaste conversation, their behavior, coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and wearing of gold and of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. 
For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. And he says, verse 7, Likewise ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Finally, be ye all of one in mind, having compassion one of another, love his brethren, be pitiful, courteous, etc. Going on a little bit more in regards to just general Christianity. He says in the first part there, chapter 3, it says, Wives, your husband may be, may not, the way he describes it is that they uh, obey not the word. Maybe that they're lost, they're not saved. Maybe that they're saved, but they're backslidden. He says, this is what you do. He doesn't say, preach at them every chance you get. I don't know, it's not, it, this doesn't justify the behavior of man, but it, it, it is, uh, I guess, definitive of the, the nature of man. Men, let, let me see, uh, uh, let's see, uh, by raising of hand, how many men love to be nagged by your wife? Would you raise your hand? Go ahead. Go ahead. How many men like to be nagged by your wife? Go ahead. Anything? <laughs> the, the, the ones that are henpecked and nagged, they raise their hand. No, I'm just saying. Oh, I love that. Listen, this is just reality. And, I, and part of it is because I think we're just the makeup of man. I, I know none of these men would do it, and I'm not saying that I would ever do this, but, but uh, if, my mom, if, my, if my, wife, my wife ever got after me about something and was going after me, yeah, you need to do this, you need to do this, I, not, not me and not you, but men might just actually even out of spite to say, you can't tell me what to do. Might even just avoid doing it a little bit longer. I know none of you guys would do that. I know that I would do that. Say, is that right? Not necessarily. That's sort of what he's saying. Listen, don't preach after him. Don't nag after him about every chance you get. He says, live a life that is pleasing to God. As he as he sees your Behavior, your conversation, that, that word, by word it means behavior. As he sees your chaste behavior, he sees that you're, a, that you're a, a caring wife, that you're a loving wife. As he sees that you do what you're supposed to do as a wife, he says that in itself will do more to bringing him about. As you live a life that it's godly, that will do more in itself to bring about somebody to Christ than a wife who says, who, who doesn't live the right kind of life, who doesn't live in submission to her husband, who doesn't live a life that's holy to God, and then the whole time says, well, you ought to just, I, I don't know why I ever married you. You know, if you don't go to church, it's just, you don't, know, you don't want to know what's going to happen if you don't start going to church. Oh, please, you know what? hey, it's church time. You need, why aren't you getting up yet? Let's go, let's go. And you say, well, again, you ladies wouldn't do that either. But I know some ladies who thought, I, I, I talked to a lady just in the last year or so, and she came to me one day she said, Pastor, you know, I was just thinking. The Lord just made, made this so clear to me. She said, for years I have, I have bugged my husband about getting up to go to church and what kind, of a, what kind of example is he to his kids and all this, that. And she goes, and it finally just dawned on me. It's like I was, re- I was reading and the Lord just said to me, you're not doing anything to help the situation. And she said, and I've decided that, all, I mean, really all it did was it, it made him upset. It said it made me more upset. It belittled my husband in the eyes of my children. And she said, I find it's like the Lord just said, why don't you just start praying for him? And she, she said, so I'm going to just start praying for him. I'm just going to be a good wife and keep praying that he'll do it. And, and may I say this? That, she's, that her husband has come to church more as far as regularly, has come more since that day than he was before. Say, so well, what's happening? Now, is he, is he every time in church? No. And it's not anybody who's here or anything. So don't go looking around. Oh, I wonder who's talking about. It's not that. What I'm saying is, there's just something about, and again, it's not doesn't necessarily justify the behavior of men, but there's something about how we're made up that if our wife is just nagging us about stuff, we almost put up a wall and say, oh yeah? It says in spiritual matters, don't be doing that kind of thing. Now then he also says this in regards to, to husbands and wives. Likewise, verse 7, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Now notice, at the end of that part, it talks about how that our prayers can be hindered if we don't have the right husband and wife relationship. But he says, husbands, 
dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. Now, there are some men who want to look at that and say, oh, yeah, well, they're, they're weak, we're strong, we're better. That's not what he's talking about. Think about that. I, I, I liken men and women to this. Think about a big old cast iron pot. You can take that thing and you can hit it against the wall. Is it going to do anything to that cast iron pot? No. You can drop it on the ground. It's not going to do anything. And it has, it has, it ser- it'll continue to serve its purpose no matter how much you beat it up, whatever. It, it does its thing. That's sort of how men are. We're tough. We're rugged. We, you know, it, things don't really affect us. Sometimes it's because we're just you know, dumb. I don't know. Things don't really affect us. And we go on. But then a, a wife, think about this. Think of a, a, an antique tea kettle. One of, or, or one of those, like a, a, not kettle, like a, a, a teapot, like, you know, ceramic, one of those kind of things, that glass. Now, if you were to take that and hit it against the wall, what's going to happen? It's going to break. If you were to drop it on the ground, it's going to shatter. It needs to be held, handled delicately. Why? It's a weaker vessel. But does that mean that it has no purpose? It has a different purpose. It, have a di- it has a different task, which is very, very pro- you wouldn't use. You wouldn't use a cast iron pot as a, tea, as, as a teapot to pour your, your tea. Same reason you wouldn't use a, you wouldn't use, you, they're, they're just not interchangeable as far as purpose. But they both have a purpose and they are to be handled differently. Guys, we're like that big old pot. Drop us, knock us into the wall, whatever. Okay, we just keep going and we do what we're supposed to do. But if we treat our wives that same way, Man, I tell you what, we can crush them. We can shatter them. They are the weaker, a weaker vessel. Not that they're any less important. They're all, we're, every one of us is valuable, and we are to all submit ourselves one to another. But it has a different purpose, a different makeup. And so we are to dwell with them. It also says in that verse in First Peter that we are to dwell with them according to knowledge. That means, guys, get to know your wives, the things that they like, things that they don't like, and, you know, actually live a life that might please them. I hate, well, I shouldn't say hate. I'll say this way. It doesn't bother me one bit if I have dirty clothes on the floor. It doesn't. It's just, you know, time, end, end of the night, taking off my, my work clothes, my regular clothes, getting ready to put on some shorts and T-shirt, go to bed. Shirt, socks, it doesn't bother me a bit. I mean, if, if my wife goes out of town, I mean, she can go out of town for that, like a two-day uh, ladies' meeting. Man, it's glorious. It's what. Come in the house, shoes kicked off. I mean, they don't they don't have to be right by the door. They kick off anywhere. Of course, I see it in my boys too now. Unfortunately, it doesn't matter to me where my clothes go. Yo, you understand? What I'm saying? But my wife. I can't think how many times she used, she would say, I mean, she has the she has the clothes hamper there. Take off my sock from the bed. Whether it goes in or not, I mean, it goes in. Hey, two points. If not, oh well, just sock. And she would come in and say, How much more effort does it take to put it the extra four inches to get it in the hamper? Some of you ladies are snickering because you have husbands that do the same thing, probably. Now I can be, I can be, man, runs my house, head of the house. I'll do what I want to do. If I want to put my socks on the dirty socks on the floor, I can put my dirty socks on the floor, or I can dwell with my wife according to knowledge. Say, you know what? She likes it when my dirty clothes actually get in the hamper. So I'm going to put my dirty clothes in the hamper. And I promise you, you young guys. Something to learn. I promise you, in the long run, if you live a life that makes your wife happy, she will return the favor and your life will be happy. You live a life to spite your wife, it was nice knowing you. <laughs> Dwelling according to knowledge. Now, say, how does this all relate? Let me say this. Husbands, as we dwell according to knowledge, as we also realize that they are a weaker vessel who need to be handled differently, hand, handled carefully, handled delicately, that ought to all go into our thinking in how to be the right 
husband who is the head of the house as we lead, like Christ leads the church. Think about this. Christ knows what temptations you can bear. We saw, we saw this in 1 Corinthians on Wednesday night. He knows what temptations you can bear, and he always makes a way of escape. He says he will not make us be tempted by anything that would be too harsh or that we could not see. He always makes a way of escape. Why is it? Because he knows how much we can bear, and he says, this is something, because I know who they are, this is a way I can deal with them. Husbands, if we are to be like Christ, we ought to know our wives and be able to say, listen, here is a thing that she likes or doesn't like, or here's a thing that can help her, or this is something that, that hurts her if I do this. And so I'm going to take this knowledge and I'm going to, as Christ who knows us and puts us in the right position to succeed, I'm going to use my knowledge of my wife and do things that are right to help my wife succeed as a good wife to her husband. Does that make sense? Now, there are times where you have, listen, you have you may have a spouse that, that's not in church, maybe a spouse that doesn't see the need to be a Christian or to serve God. What do you do? You pray for them. You love them. Keep being the best spouse that you can be. At times, there will be... Listen, here's the reality. If you are living your life for God, whether you ever say to your spouse, will you come to church with me? If you're living your life for God, they know she would like me to come to church with, with her. Or he would like me to come to church with her. He would like me to come to church with him. They know. Because they see that your life is centered around Christ. Rosie, behave yourself back there, all right? <laughs> She's laughing about something. All right, all right, I'll just tease it. We have to be care- we have to we have to love and pray and care for our spouses if they don't come. Now I'll say this. Again, well, preacher, we're both in church. In fact, we're both faithful to church, but you don't know what our home is like. It's not like that. Then you ask yourself, okay, what needs to be done? What needs to be changed? I can't say this is a universal rule, but many times I've found the husband says, well, my wife won't submit. Okay, the first thing that they need to do is they need to check themselves, am I being the kind of husband that she can submit to? Let's put it on ourselves. Wives, you might say, well, listen, I can't submit to my husband. Why not? Well, I don't think that he's doing what's best for me. Well, are you praying for him? Or are you just opposing? Are you, are you talking, now let me say this, as we submit one, one to another, verse 21, leading into husbands and wives, it doesn't need, a, a, a foolish husband, a foolish husband will say, well, I'm the head of the house, I don't ever need to listen to my wife on any kind of decision, on any kind of thing. I'll just make every decision, what I say goes. A foolish husband will do that. Because, have you noticed that when God puts two people together, that many times their strengths complement each other? The two become one. God puts the two of them together so that their strengths can all be used for the common cause of the cause of Christ. And if a, a foolish husband would say, well, I don't need to listen to my wife, what you're doing is saying, even though God gave me all th- this woman with all the gifts that she has, all the talents she has, I'm going to disregard that and I'm going to make sure I only do everything. That's usually an egotistical, prideful position. You'd be foolish, man, not to listen to your wives. Wives, you ought to in the right spirit. Meek and quiet spirit. Meek and quiet spirit is not that you know, just come cowering. Meek and quiet is that you're not domineering. Meek and quiet is I, I have, I'm showing control of my emotions. I'm showing control and praying and trusting that God's working through this situation. Meek and quiet spirit, you say, all right, well, this is the situation. Let's talk about what we think would be best. Here's some of the pros. Here's some of the cons. And you ought to communicate as a husband and wife and be able to talk with each other and be able to then say, here's why, what I think, here's what I think. And now at the very end, maybe the husband has, he makes that decision. But you might just find that most times a husband or wife who love each other, have the right roles, they will come to the same conclusion because they've sought it in prayer. They say, Lord, what should we do? And the husband says, all right, we're going to go. When we moved here, I'll just use our, this example, and then we're going to move on here in a few minutes. When we moved here, we were living in 
Atlanta, Georgia, just outside Atlanta. We came up here on, in January from Atlanta. Now, granted, we we lived at North most of our lives, but but I'll be honest, it was you you, go, you spent you spend a couple winters down south, and then you come back up, it just seems extra cold. And then when we first came, we the directions we got, well, we came from we we thought we we're this close, we stopped and saw my grandma Cummins in Ohio, and then we drove over. So the directions we had were to come over, come up Route 11, and then come over this way. In fact, we came all the way up to 322. Uh, they said, three, come to go to 322, because then it's a straight shot in. Well, it, everybody knows that once you get on Route 11 and start heading north out of Youngstown, there's nothing but cornfield. And then you get to 322, and you start coming this way, and there's nothing but cornfields. And in January, snow and dirty-looking ice and slush and we drove all the way, and we came to the church and stopped here. So we did drive through the big town of Jamestown. We got here. We got here on a Friday. It wasn't until Sunday that we even knew that there was a McDonald's or a, a Walmart or anything that direction. We never went through there. We came again. We're coming from Atlanta, where we had we we had a nice apartment. We had a we. I mean, any any store you could ever want was in within five minutes of us, or five miles, maybe twenty minutes with traffic. It was all there. We had a we, we enjoyed our life in, in Georgia. We came here. Now I'm not. Obviously, we're here. We're loving it. We're, I'm not, don't say that we we were dragged, you know, kicking and screaming. We get here, and we stayed in the the beautiful trailer that we had over here. And those who were here, I can see you going, oh man. And it was a, it was a warm place to stay. And we were thankful for it. We went home. We had a great time that weekend. We went home. And my wife said, well, we, we started praying. And my wife said, well, I don't know. She said, well, let's keep praying. And we'll see if they even call us back. They called us back. They said, come back again in February. Because, you know, February is even nicer than January. We came back in February. Cold, bitter. And we got done. When we left, before we, before we even got home, we knew this is where God was bringing us. Even though you hadn't voted yet, you know, I, I, it was going to be awkward when I was going to move in and you say, "Well, we need to re-vote." Re- yeah, uh, we knew. But my wife said, "I'll be honest." She said, "I don't know if I could live in that trailer." We began to pray. I said, "All right, well, listen. What are we going to do? We're going to do what God wants us to do." We knew it was confirmed. Then the church calls us and says, "We voted." Whatever percent, we, we want you to come. We said, all right, we'll come. My wife, again, said, I don't know if I can live in that trailer. And it wasn't, it, she's not, she's not, you know, it's not that she was, you know, you know her. She's, she's got a good spirit about things. And I said, well, let's just pray. So I said, we're going to live in the trailer because the church can afford to pay us what they can afford to pay us. If we live in the trailer, we'll be able to be full time. And we could focus on building the church as opposed to me going out and working 40 hours a week so we could have a place to live and then work part-time for the church. She said, okay. Little did she know. I came up, I brought a bunch of stuff up, made one trip, myself and Jason Perlack, we brought a bunch of stuff up. And we pull in, and there was already work being done on that trailer. And I didn't tell her about it yet. And, uh, and she began to think about this. Every once in a while she'd say, I'd say well, why don't we just get there and we'll see what it's like. And finally, I had to say, well, listen, they're, they're doing a little bit of work. Really? What they do? So well, you'll get it. When you see it, we'll get there. And we came. And when she walked in, she said, oh, this is so much better. And they'd done a lot of really good improvements on it. And we, and praise the Lord, we lived in it for 18 months. I say, oh, let's say this. I knew we were coming and we were going to live in that trailer. She, she, now, if I would have never listened to her concerns, she would have been upset with me. She would have been probably bitter with me. I can't believe, potentially, could have been bitter with me. He can't believe he's going to move me up there. We, he won't even listen to what I have to say. We began to pray. And we, and we both realized, no, this is what God wants. And she said, all right, you're right. This is where God's leading us. And she submitted. When we got here, it was a very pleasant surprise for her. 
And then we started opening drawers and finding all kinds of goodies and gifts that people put in the thing. It was nice. It was a blessing. I say this. I say all that to say this. Not that we're great, but this. When you abide by God's blueprint, when you abide by God's blueprint, things are sweet. Things can be right. Wives, submit yourselves. But I just can't. What you're saying is, no, I'd rather disobey God. But preacher, here in the real world, what you're saying is, I don't want to change. I'd just rather disobey God than submit. But at the same time, husbands, love your wives. Love them in a way that Christ loved the church. Love them in such a way that they would, that your wife would never, ever, ever, ever have any concern to say, can I follow this guy? Love them. Get to know them. Go with them according to knowledge. Get to know them. Be the right kind of husband. Treat them as a weaker vessel. Not that they're any less than you, but rather that they are different than you. Wives, pray for your husbands. Pray for them. Be a support to them. I also th- we, all, we, we said this, you know, that nobody likes to be nagged. But at the same time, and I'm not going to let the guys make, make the guys raise their hand, but we all like to be praised at some times too. Well, uh, I shouldn't have to do that. No, you shouldn't, but we still like it. And it still works at times. We ought to just love each other. Live for each other. Do it not because the pastor said, not because the, the, the relationship gurus say so, but because Christ tells us. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Just do it. Pray for them. Love them. Follow their lead. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Now, if you have a concern, say, talk to them. In a meek and quiet spirit, lovingly, with the right spirit. Can I ask you a question? I don't know. I don't understand why 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 you want to do that. Can you help me understand that? Husbands, don't be a jerk. Am I allowed to say that? Don't be a jerk. Don't say because I said so. It doesn't help. Be honest. Say, well, here, here's listen. Here's the reason why. I've made that decision. Do you have, do you have what, what are your concerns? Maybe there's something I'm missing. So when the decision's made, wives, submit yourselves. So husbands, don't make the decision based on, well, I'm the man, I can do whatever I want to. Make a decision on, how does this affect my wife and our home and our relationship? And not only that, what does the world see as a result of our relationship? Does it point them to Christ in the church? Or does it point them to a place of just wreck and ruin? One last thing, and we'll be done right here. In regards to, I just, I meant to say this earlier, I should have said it earlier, but in regards to submission, God created the home to have one head. First of all, He created the church to have one head, Christ. He created the home to have one head, the husband. Think about all the movies. Whenever you have a creature with two heads, it's a two headed what? It, we, we laugh. It's a joke. It's funny. Your home, wives, wives. You say, "Well, I ought to be the head." You're trying to make it a two-headed. It's not going to be something normal. It's a two-headed monster. At the same time, husbands lead. Don't be just somebody who says, "Well, I don't know what to do. I want my wife to do all that." No, God created you to be the head of the house. Not because you're better. In fact, most of us husbands, if we're honest, would probably say, you know, my wife, she'd get, a whole lot, get along better, a whole lot better without me than I can without her. She's our completer. She's the one who, she, she's the, the help meet for us. Just fill your roles and show the world a picture of what the relationship of Christ to the church is through the husband and the wife. Next week, I guess we'll get the kids and all that other thing. And I ought to make sure the kids are up here so we can really nail them on children obey your parents. Amen. Let's stand together, heads bowed, eyes closed. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for 
this truth, Lord. Just a simple thing, Lord. We laugh, we joke, we have a good time at some of the different things. But Lord, it, it, it's so true, it's so important. Lord, to have this right relationship as a picture of you and the church, Lord, I wonder how often I wonder how often people are turned away from Christ because of homes that Christians, professing Christians have. Lord, not, not be that way. Lord, help us to realize. Lord, maybe there's today there's somebody who's lost. We've talked about the relationship of husbands and wives, but Lord, it's based on the relationship of what Christ did for the church. Christ who loved the church. Christ who gave himself for the church. Christ who is sanctifying us, purifying us, making us chase, Lord, presenting to be able to be presented to him as a glory, that glorious bride, a glorious church. Lord, I pray to you, if there's someone who's lost, that today they would understand and realize that they can be saved. They can be added to that body of Christ. They can be part of the bride of Christ. By trusting in you. Lord, I pray that you would just help us, Lord, to yield to these principles. Lord, for those that are not married yet, that they would take these things into account. And Lord, just determine that they're going to do things your way. For those that are married, Lord, that they would say, uh, this is how we're going to be. And if, there, and if it's not, I will make the changes I need to make. Lord, that we would all have the right kind of homes. Lord, I pray that you just bless now in this invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. As the music begins to play, the altars are open. If you need to come, why don't you come? If God's dealing with your heart about a matter. It might just be a burden that's on your heart. Maybe it's something that the Lord's dealt with you about during the message. Maybe it's something totally different. Whatever it might be. If you need to come use the altar, I invite you to come. Some are already praying. Some are coming down the aisle.